Um, we've been talking about, for the last two weeks, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord our healer. The Lord said in Exodus 15, 26, Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord that heals you. And we talked about that word Rapha means to heal and return to normal. So that's what God wants for us, to heal and return to normal. And in Isaiah 53, 1, Isaiah asked the question, who has believed our report? I say in this every week to kind of remind you, why is this not work any better for us than it does? Because we have a hard time believing the report. Because we've had 2,000 years of unbelief taught to us. We're in, tonight, that's what we're going to talk about, the, what I call the unbelief verses. But he said, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Verse 4, surely he has borne our griefs. We pointed out that's the word for maladies, anxieties, calamities, and diseases. He carried our sorrows, which is anguish and affliction. We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are Rapha. That's what it says, we are healed. We are Rapha. Jehovah Rapha healed us by the stripes of Jesus. That's, you know, when we take communion, it's not just a religious ritual. That's why Jesus said as often as you do, as you do this, remember. Remember what this is about. We, we pointed this out last week. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, he said, the reason some of you are sick and some have died, because they don't properly discern the Lord's body. They don't realize what the Lord did for them. And he said, this is the reason. You know, we have a million reasons why somebody died, why somebody's sick. But the Bible really only gives one reason. That's the only reason it gives. And we're going to, tonight we're going to get to a verse where the disciples look for another reason, and Jesus shuts that one down. The only reason we're ever given is you, you don't do communion correctly. You don't understand what I've done for you. And then in Psalm 103, the Lord said, Bless the Lord, O my soul, all is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And don't forget his benefits. Who does what? Pardons all your iniquities and heals all your diseases. That's what the bread and the, the blood is about. The, the blood pardons all your iniquities. And the bread heals all your diseases. In fact, Jesus told the, when the woman came that was looking for healing for her daughter, he called healing the children's bread. He said, I am the bread of life. I mean, that word bread throughout the scripture means wholeness and deliverance and, and healing. Jesus said, he who eats this bread and drinks this cup will never die again. We'll never, we'll never suffer. We're, we're not supposed to. And we went through all of the, the healing verses that, that God called himself or some of them in the Old Testament. And then we talked about how Jesus was a picture of God. And he was a manifestation of God in the flesh. And how many people did Jesus heal that asked for healing? All of them. In fact, if you were here a couple weeks ago, we ran through Matthew. Healed them all. Great multitudes. Great multitudes. Healed them all. Healed them all. Everybody in the city. We pointed out when Paul was on the Isle of, uh, was it Malta or wherever he was at? Everybody on the island got healed. When Philip, who we pointed out was an IHOP busboy, went down to Samaria... Everybody Philip prayed for got healed. Back in that day, everybody was getting healed, which always begs the question, why is it not working for us? Well, like I said, we've had thousands of years of unbelief taught to us. It, this isn't meant as, a, as an attack, but the Catholic Church, for 1,500 years, locked the Bible away. Average people weren't even allowed to read it. In fact, it was a death penalty for the average Christian to have the Scripture. You weren't allowed to have the scripture. You definitely weren't allowed to translate it into something other people could read. William Tyndale, you ever seen Tyndale Publishing or a Tyndale Bible? William Tyndale was burned at the stake by the church because he translated the Bible into English where the people could read it. And so the problem is we have had so much unbelief thrown at us for thousands of years. And then plus we get it from the world. They're loaded with unbelief. Uh, COVID, and uh, they're working on, uh, a while back they were trying to crank up Ebola again. That one, I guess, petered out. You know, there, there's more coming. Listen, brothers and sisters, they figured this out now. If, if and when COVID peters out, they'll come up with something else. I mean, think about it over the years, swine flu, bird flu, uh, whatever, H1N1, AIDS. I remember back when AIDS came out, oh, millions of us are going to die from AIDS. 
You know, they're constantly trying to give us, well, that we need to know by his stripes we're healed. We also pointed out last week in Galatians 3, it says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having been made a curse for us. And last week we wrapped up reading what the curse of the law was, and we listed all the diseases that are in the curse of the law. Boils and rashes and itching and tumors and pestilence and uh, pandemic diseases. And then he said, in every sickness and every plague not even written down in this book of the law. Christ redeemed us from the curse. So if we're redeemed from the curse of the law, that means we're redeemed from every sickness and every plague. Now I could teach this for another six months and there's still going to be people going, well, yeah, what about... And then they got their four unbelief sections. Let me tell you, let's take a little quick discussion of how to interpret the Bible. Listen, if the Bible says 900 times God is love, and you find two verses that seem to indicate he's not, you don't take the two verses and create a theology with it. Either they weren't translated correctly, you don't understand them correctly, but the reality is the Bible doesn't contradict itself. But what we do is we misinterpret. Charles Capps used to say the Bible's so simple you've got to have help to misunderstand it. And we got tons of theologians helping us. I, Karen and I watched, uh, might as well, I mean, you can watch it yourself, so I don't feel like I'm judging anybody. Andy Stanley, one of the most popular churches in the country. Huge. Influences, thousands of churches have been influenced by Andy Stanley. Karen and I watched him and heard him say, well, you know, if the Bible disagrees with science, you've got to go with science. I'm like, are you an idiot? Science changes every six months. Go get a biology book from 30 years ago. It's a joke. Go get a physics book from 10 years ago. It's a joke. Science is that, what, what is this? In fact, they're constantly using science to disprove the Bible, and the Bible ultimately turns out being correct. I've shared this before, but there, maybe in case somebody missed it. They used to use science to prove the Bible wasn't true because Peter said when God comes, he's going to dissolve the elements with an intense heat with the, and with fire. And the scientists in the late 1800s and early 1900s proved you cannot make a fire hot enough to dissolve certain elements. Certain elements just won't dissolve in fire. Stupid fishermen. You know, ha, 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 jokes on them. Only thing is, the stupid fisherman didn't actually say melt. The stupid fisherman said the elements will come untied. I bet when the stupor, fi stupid fisherman wrote it, he's going, what? What does it mean they're coming untied? Anybody know what happens in a nuclear reaction? The elements untie. It was a nuclear physics statement written, written by the Apostle Peter 2,000 years ago, way before science understood it, way before the scientists had a clue. You know, the Civil War, you know why bunches of people died? Many of the soldiers died? Because they would reuse bandages, infection. In fact, it was the leading killer in the Civil War's infection. Well, you know what God wrote 4,000 years ago? When you're done with a bandage, burn it. In fact, God had cleanliness laws that if they'd have followed 4,000 years ago, he wrote that down. God knew more. So this whole, when some preacher's going, well, you know, if you got to disagree with science... Sci and plus, who are the most dangerous people in the universe? Scientists. People talk about well, the Crusades and, the, and all that stuff. Man, a few hundred thousand people died in, in all of the history, assuming it was Christians, which I say it's not. Scientists, who invented nuclear bombs? Who invented hydrogen bombs? Who invented rockets for ro delivery of bombs? Who invented COVID? It was in a lab. Come on, only by Fulio scientists. Who invented mustard gas and all the others? Scientists have killed millions and millions and millions of people. The German scientists did experiments. I don't know why I'm talking about this, because we're talking about healing. But you know, sometimes people get so, they get so bound up in, well, can you trust the Bible? Yes, you can trust the Bible. And don't let, see in these last days, the Bible says there could come preachers along. They're going to deny the master that's in this book. They're going to deny the book. It's the other thing Andy Stanley said. He said, well, we should just kind of put the Bible on the shelf and just preach the gospel. Babylon B, if you've never been to Babylon B, it's a great site. It's a Christian satire site. Babylon B, had a, it's like, it looks like a news site, but it's all satire. 
And they said, Andy Stanley, shocked to find out that the, new, the gospel is in the Bible. So back to healing. So there's dozens and dozens. By his stripes were healed. Peter says, by his stripes you were healed. At Matthew 8, he said Jesus physically healed them to fulfill Isaiah 53. You got Isaiah 53. You got God's name. I am healer. And yet we got millions of Christians that hang on to the four unbelief verses. We'll start with the, the one they kind of use, but it's not their favorite. We'll start with the least popular, but still one you hear. 2 Timothy 4.20. 2 Timothy. Four verses. Four. Four. That they use against hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses that God wants people healed. So in 1 Timothy 4.20. Oh, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy 4.20. 2 Timothy 4.20. Erastus stayed in Corinth. But Trophimus I left in Miletus sick. That proves God doesn't want anybody healed. How does that prove it? Well, Paul left him sick. So that proves it was God's will to he not heal him. Oy. It doesn't prove anything. First, let's define the word sick. It's the word astheneo. It means to be feeble or weak. It doesn't mean <coughs> sick. It means to be weak. It means to be feeble. It's the exact same word that is used in Romans chapter 4 when it says Abraham grew not weak in faith. It's the exact same word. Well, he didn't say Abraham didn't go sick in faith. He started throwing up because of faith. You understand what he meant. So Paul simply said, look, Trophimus was tired. I don't know if he was tired. Listen, yesterday, Carol and I went for this real brisk walk, 30 minutes. And uh, then Bethany wanted to meet for coffee and, and lunch, so she wanted to go for another brisk walk, and it was semi-brisk. And then, we're sitting so long drinking coffee, Bethany goes, we should walk again. So totally, we walked like 90 minutes yesterday. Y'all ought to be glad I'm here today. Because I almost, Karen almost left Thomas asyntheneo at home. Because that, this word, you, you don't build a theology off of a verse that doesn't even say what you think it says. And even if Paul did leave him sick, well, Paul's not God. Listen, don't, Paul had Timothy circumcised. Read the book of Acts. Paul had Timothy circumcised for fear of the Jews. It's in da, it's the book of Acts. Paul would later write, if you receive circumcision for fear of the Jews, Christ is of no benefit to you. He screwed up. Paul was, he had pride issues at points in the book of Acts where the Holy Spirit spoke to him and he didn't want to listen. I mean, Paul, he got in almost a fist fight with Barnabas. So don't, get it out of your head that Paul was the perfect man because he wasn't. So sometimes, you know, we elevate, oh, it was the mighty apostle Paul. Paul was a man like me and you. So next time somebody throws this little Trophimus, he left him weak and feeble. That's all he left him. He didn't leave him... It doesn't, it doesn't say he left him puking and dysentery and people add that stuff. Now let's go to John chapter 9, verse 1. John 9, 1. John 9, 1. So unbelief, verse 1, is that one. You're gonna, you talk to people, you talk to Christian people. The world doesn't know these verses. This is Christian people. This is so-called Christian unbelieving believers. Listen, how many of y'all know there's a bunch of them out there? Unbelieving believers. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born blind? So let's stop there. They're walking along, they see a blind man. Blind from when? Birth. Now, the disciples, being typical human beings, what is it they want, want to know? Why? Who's to blame? Who's to blame? Why did this happen? Who, who can we point to? Did he sin or his parents? Now, I love the part, he was born blind. Did they think about the question before they asked it? Did he sin in his mother's womb? He flipped once and kicked her in the stomach and, ooh, that's a sin. No, that's not a sin. Babies in the womb can't sin. So they didn't even think about the question. But how many times have you ever been, felt attacked, something happens, you don't receive the healing you believe in for, something doesn't manifest, the temptation is this. Well, what's what happened? 
Why is this happening to me? What's causing this? This is, listen, Greg, Greg, uh, Graham Cook said this is an invalid question. And I love what he said, and it turns you into an invalid. When you're asking the why question, why is this happening? Why is this happening to me? Why, what caused this? Who's to blame for this? So they ask him who was born blind. Verse 3. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. So he was made blind because God wanted to reveal his works in him. Is that what it says? Well, let's keep reading. And then we'll come back. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So go back to verse 3. Verse 3 is number 2, unbelief. In fact, this is a diabolical verse people use. They said, who sinned? Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, when you read that, how many of y'all have heard taught God made him blind so he could prove he could heal him? I've heard that taught. Now, that makes a lot of sense to me. I remember one time when Michael was little, uh, he was probably about seven or eight, I, I dragged him out to the road and I, I let a car run over his legs and crush them so that I could prove to him I loved him and would pay for his medical bills to see him get, get reconstructive surgery on that. And so, you know, that's how I proved my love to my dad. That's how I proved I would look out for my son. What would y'all do if I did that? You'd call social services. Yet, they accuse God of that. They say, well, God made this man blind so later on he could heal him. Now, I'll prove to you in a dozen different ways that isn't what it says. Let's go with the simplest way that isn't what it says. Remember, they said Jesus casts out demons by the power of the devil. And what did Jesus say? He said, that's a house divided against itself and it will fall. He said, if the devil put the devils in and the devil's casting the devils out, Jesus called that a house divided against itself. So if God's making people sick so he can heal them, he's a house divided against himself. That's the first argument, but it isn't even the best argument. Now I'm going to teach you a little Greek. There is no punctuation in Greek. There are no commas. There are no periods. There's no punctuation. When you read punctuation in your Bible, it was added by the translators. So let me read you the Young's literal just leave that up, Thomas. But I'll read you the Young's literal, and then I'm going to show you that's exactly what this says. And passing by, now the Young's literal translation, it's not a translation you can read, but it's a literal exact rendering of the Greek in the Hebrew. And passing by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who did sin, this one or his parents, that he should be born blind? Jesus answered, neither did this one sin nor his parents, but that the works of God might be manifested in him, it behooveth me to be working the works of God, who set me while it is day, lest the night come. He, he said, neither this man nor his parents, but, now what is but? Conjunction, junction, what's your function? Everybody remember conjunction, junction? What's but? It's joining two separate ideas together. They say, Who's to blame? What's the cause? Jesus said, neither, but. You could replace the word but in the Greek, or in the, in the translation with the word nevertheless. But, but, the works of God will be revealed in him. What's Jesus saying? Look, y'all are focusing on the problem. I am the answer. Why would you ask what caused it when the answer is here? He said, but that the works of God might be manifested in him, I must work the works of God. So what does Jesus call the works of God? Healing him. Take the comma out. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Take that period away. The, Greek, the translators added that. Go to the next verse. I must work the works of God. But that the works of God might be revealed in him, I must work the works of God. The translators added the period. It wasn't in the Greek. It doesn't make any sense that God's going to make you... Are there enough blind people to go around? God's going, you know, there's going to be a shortage of blind people. Jesus is going to be walking, and there's not going to be enough blind people 
I, I, better, I better create myself a blind person. That is stupid. No kids in here, I can say stupid. And I can also say asinine again. It's asinine. It's back years ago in, in Italy, Carol was trying to buy a postcard. And she had only a real big bill, and the postcard was like 50 cents, and she had this, you know, $20 bill. And the woman in Italian goes, stupido americano. She was like, like, I can't understand that? <laughs> stupido americanos. He's, it's stupid to say God made him blind, and that's what Jesus is doing. He's going, y'all are focusing on why he's blind, but... I'm here to work, work the works of God. In fact, doesn't the Bible say Jesus went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil? Doesn't say he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of God. So this is just, uh, again, it's a, it, the translators caused us a problem, but it doesn't make any sense. Now we'll go to my favorite. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians, this, this one is going to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt God doesn't heal anybody or everybody. Heal some, doesn't heal others. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7. Paul's thorn in the flesh. How many of y'all heard of Paul's thorn in the flesh? If you've never heard of Paul's thorn, this is the champion unbelief verse. If you talk to Christians and they're going to throw unbelief on you that God doesn't heal everybody, this is the one you're going to hear. Verse 7, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Okay, let's go back to verse 7. How many of you have ever heard this preached in unbelief? I have. So let's break it down and see what the man said. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now what does that mean by the abundance of revelation? How many of y'all, your ears here, lest he get in pride? How many of y'all, that's what I heard taught. He's getting all this revelation and he's getting full of pride. Now, is being exalted a bad thing or a good thing? Or is being, being exalted good or bad? Well, 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will exalt you. So apparently being exalted isn't necessarily a bad thing. In fact, what does exalted mean? Anybody know what exalted means? It means to be lifted up, to be elevated. How many of y'all think being lifted up and elevated is a bad thing? It is if it's in pride and an ego. But he said, what's causing him to get lifted up? Revelations. Where do revelations come from? The God. Specifically, where do they come from? The Word of God. So he said, I'm getting all this revelation from God. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Now, I, I could end this right here. I have heard Paul had an eye disease. I have heard Paul had, had uh, kidney problems. I've heard all kinds of things. He, did he say... I've got a sickness. What did he say the thorn in the flesh was? A messenger of Satan. That's the Greek word angel of Satan. What do we call them more commonly? Demons. To do what? What's buffet mean? Beat him. Lest I be exalted above measure. Again, I've heard this taught so that he wouldn't get in pride. Let's run another little experiment. What was Satan's sin? Pride. Now, does this make any sense at all to you? Paul's getting in pride, so the devil says, oh, I must do something to go attack him lest he get in pride. That's how it's taught. That's what people say. Well, the revela he, because he's getting revelation, this messenger of Satan comes, lest I be exalted above measure. So let me get this straight. The, the father of lies who fell with his pride is going to keep Paul out of pride. Please. That's a really, again, you talk about an insane interpretation. He tells us it's a demon spirit attacking him. Do we, do we have another example of a demon spirit har harassing and attacking Paul? There is one example in the book of Acts. I just read it this week. Where the, the demon-possessed girl follows behind him. 
yelling, this man is servant of the Most High God. It says it vexed him in spirit. It harassed him until finally he cast that demon out. So this wasn't the, the only time where demon spirits went after Paul. He said, so I got this demon spirit. So verse 8, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. So what's he do? What's he doing about this demon spirit that's attacking him? What's the word pleaded? Begging. He said, three times I begged the Lord, get this thing off of me. And in verse 9, God said, heck no, you are stuck with that forever. All you get is grace and that's sufficient for you. Be glad you got that, you little loser. That's how it's taught. My grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Well, let's break what God just told him down. What is grace? Unmerited, unearned, undeserved, favor from God. How are we saved? By grace. Grace is the power of God that saves us. Grace is the power of God that heals us. We're saved by grace. We're healed by grace. Grace is what makes everything in your life work. It's His grace. It's all by grace. So God says, my grace... Remember, He says, He begs God to get it off of Him, and God goes, my grace is sufficient. Now, the, and I don't mean this to attack, it's just reality. The group that's more anti-healing than most is Baptists. You know, healing's passed away with the apostles. And you know, again, I'm not condemning because, praise God, they preach the gospel and get people saved. Charismatics aren't doing that. But um, the, the, they're preaching the gospel. They're preaching getting saved. They're preaching, and how does any Baptist, how you say, we're saved by grace through faith. And that, not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. Every Baptist knows that verse. We're saved by grace. So ask your Baptist friend the next time they say, well, Paul's thorn in the flesh. God said my grace is sufficient. If somebody went to a Baptist and said three times I begged God to save me and God said my grace is sufficient, would that Baptist hear no? What would the Baptist tell him? The grace is there, brother. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart. God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. His grace is all you need. His grace will put you over. His grace will get you saved. Isn't that what they would tell the person? And yet when it comes to this demonic thing attacking Paul, my grace is sufficient means no. Let's keep reading. What does he say? For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Have we read that anywhere before? Let the weak say, I am strong. Let those who have no strength wait upon the Lord and they will mount up on wings like eagles. God, when we have no strength, is exactly what we need grace for. God is going, this is exactly what I'm trying to teach you, son, is my power is manifested when you get onto my grace. Don't beg and plead for me to do it for you because you already have the power. I'm going to prove it to you again. We're going to come at it another way. So therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress. For Christ's sake, notice he doesn't mention sickness and disease. For when I am weak... Then I am strong. He got the revelation. He said, I got it. I got it. His grace is... Listen, everybody in this room, that's all we need. His grace is all we need to prosper financially. His grace is all we need to, to walk a sin-free life. His grace is all we need to walk in health. It's all by grace. It's None of it's by works. If it's by works, it's condemned as being under the law. It's all by grace. He is telling Paul, you have my grace. That is sufficient. You don't need to beg me. You don't need to beg me three times to do this for you. You don't need to ask me anything. How do I know that is true? Well, James 4, 7 tells me, submit to God and you resist the devil and he will flee from you. You resist him. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks out like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Therefore, resist him. So James tells, us, you James tells us, you resist the devil. Peter tells us, you resist the devil. Now, let's go 
to Paul's writing four years after this. Four, Paul wrote 2 Corinthians four years before he wrote the book of Ephesians. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 6. Let's see if he learned anything. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Ephesians 6.10 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, demons. Therefore, you take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. I think he got the revelation because he wrote this four years later. He goes, wait a minute, I got it now. We put on the armor. We stand against the devil. We fight the devil. We take the sword of the spirit and cut his guts out and smack him, smack him with the shield. He writes this. He said, you will be able to withstand in the evil day. The thorn in the flesh is Paul giving us the lesson that he learned. It's the lesson we all need to learn. Is it's all we need is his grace. His grace is sufficient. It's all we need. We don't need to beg him. How many Christians beg and plead, pray all night, begging God, oh God, I'm crying out to you. You know, that's all the waste of energy. The Bible says, come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain grace and help in a time of need. And that's what that whole thorn in the flesh was about. He goes, this demonic force is attacking me. In fact, what do we know from Mark chapter 4? The sower sows the word. Paul's getting revelation from the word. And what happens? Satan comes, the thorn in the flesh comes to try and steal the word. And in fact, Mark chapter 4 defines what thorns are. Cares and pressures of life. Go back and read 1 or 2 Corinthians 11. Paul was talking about how much pressure he was under, worried about the churches, under strain because of all the stuff he's dealing with and all the pressure that he's under. That's what that thorn in the flesh, the thorn in the flesh, listen, how many of y'all have experienced it? Just the pressures of life. They're just beating on you. They're like thorns just nagging you. But we can shake that off. That's what he got the revelation on. We, it's grace. It's all grace. It's not any works. It's nothing you have to do. God didn't tell him no. Somebody says, God saved me. He's going to say, my grace is sufficient. God's not, listen, God's not getting up off the throne to come save somebody. Jesus already saved everybody. But if they don't receive it, it doesn't do them any good. How do they receive it? By receiving the grace of God. That's what the Bible says. Receive God's grace. Open your heart to His grace. His grace will heal, deliver, set free. So next time somebody throws that thorn of the flesh foolishness, first, it's not a sickness. He said it's a demonic. So he tells you exactly what it is. And then second, he got delivered. So that brings us to my final favorite fellow, Job. Job chapter 1. How? What about Job? I'm just like poor old Job. What about Job? Mm -mm -mm. Well, we could skip to the end of the book. Job gets healed. It's hard to use Job for an example of somebody who doesn't get healed when Job does get healed. <laughs> but <laughs> here we go. We'll spend, a, we'll spend five minutes on Job. So if next time somebody throws this at you, you'll at least have some idea. Verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. He had seven sons and three daughters born to him. And also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels. He's rich. Verse 4, And his sons would go feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. So it was when their days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. He would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God. This Job did how often? Regularly. So let's get a picture. He's a good man. He's a godly man. His kids are wild. He, he was 0 for, 0 for 10 on the kids. Seven sons, three daughters. Apparently none of them turned out real well. And they're partying, drinking, partying. And he is terrified that they're going to curse God. He's offering sacrifices. And how often is he doing it? Regularly. So it was when the days, or verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And that word sons there is the word for offspring or creation. And somebody said, well, how could Satan have access to God? You ever wondered that? Well, whose, whose authority was Satan operating under? 
Adam's. Adam had access to God. Satan's operating under Adam's authority because he has no access now. I guarantee you he's not showing up in heaven now. So Satan shows up and the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered, the Lord said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth. Is there a New Testament verse that quotes that? Satan roams about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's telling God, I was roaming around looking for somebody that I could devour. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? I never figured out why God sicked Satan on Job. You ever wondered why God sicked Satan on Job? If you have a good Greek, a Hebrew concordance or a good Bible software, go look up that word, have you considered? Doesn't mean have you considered. I don't know why the translators translate that. If you have like a New American Standard, it, it'll, the margin will tell you the actual rendering. The Lord said to Satan, this is what it actually says in the Hebrew, go look it up. Have you set your heart on my servant Job? He knew why Satan was there. He was looking, he was coming to get quote-unquote permission to attack Job. Or was he coming to get permission? We'll cover that in a minute too. He's a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. So Satan said to the Lord, does the Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him? This is where the whole hedge stuff comes from. You know, uh, let's pray a hedge. I kind of agree with Tim Hawkins, the Christian comedian. I'd rather have a concrete wall, but, you know, pray a hedge. You have blessed the work of his hands and the possessions of increase your land, but stretch out your hand and touch all he has, and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do, lay, do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So God gave him permission to nail Job. How many of y'all used the word behold this week? How many of y'all this week said, Oh, Carolyn, behold the deer running through our backyard. We had a big herd of them just like racing through the yard, middle of the day, I don't know why. Oh, Carolyn, behold, I put a shelf up today. Behold the shelf I put up. How many of y'all use that word behold? No, nobody. It's the Hebrew word hine. It literally means open up your eyes and look. Satan said, you're cheating. You got him. You blocked me from him. You're cheating. You're keeping me from my right to attack him. How do I know Satan had a right to attack him? Well, in Jesus, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus told Peter, he said, Simon, Simon, Satan has demanded his right to sift you like wheat. Not asked for, demanded. He had the right. Satan had the right under the old covenant to test men and to put men under pressure. Jesus, God said, open your eyes and look. He's in your power. How was Job in his power? Well, Job tells you. Job chapter 3, verse 25. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. What is fear? It's the opposite of faith. Faith is believing something good you can't see is coming to pass in your life. Fear is believing something negative you can't see is coming to pass in your life. We know from the scripture, Proverbs it tells us this, what a man fears will come upon him. We know this from the New Testament. Fear is what opens the door to the devil. The devil's going, you're cheating. You're keeping me from him. And God's going, open your eyes, you buffoon. I'm not cheating. He's in your power. You just don't recognize it. I'm not cheating. Don't accuse me of cheating. Why is he... How much fear did he have with his own children? Sacrificing constantly. Oh, they've cursed God. Oh, they've cursed God. And he has a winner of a wife, too. I mean, remember his wife tells him, why don't you just curse God and die? I mean, this guy's got a screwed up family. And uh, he said, literally in verse 25, what Job said is, I knew it. I knew this was going to happen to me. I knew it. I didn't I tell you all this was going to He was proud. He prophesied at this point. I knew it. I knew this was going to happen. Listen, if you get into that level of unbelief, the devil's going to beat your brains out too. He's going to beat my brains out. If, all, if I'm constantly fearing something and constantly, you know, oh, I got I to gotta be careful. I, my kids are going to die. I better call them and make sure they're wearing their seatbelts. Oh, my kids are going to die. I better call them and make sure they're wearing their bicycle helmets. We rode helmet. We rode bikes. Karen rode her bike with her eyes closed, no helmet on. 
she did hit a car, but <clears throat> we rode with no helmets. We drank out of garden hoses. We played in the turf. Our, our swing sets and monkey bars were on top of asphalt. But you know, if I'm constantly, oh gosh, I hope Rebecca's kids don't die. Okay, oh, Rebecca, you better hook them up. Oh God, please don't let them die. Rebecca always forgets to hook them in the car seat. I'm using it as an example. She hooks them. She's diligent. Oh God, I hope they don't die. Oh God, don't let my grandkids die. Oh God, don't let... You know what I'm open begging for? Some negativity. I'm opening the door. The Bible says life and death are in the power of the tongue. Job was constantly confessing his fear. Now how do I know this? And we'll wrap up with this. In fact, go over to Mark chapter 5 verse 7. I want to finished his point before I um, wrap up. Mark 5, 7. Summoned a bunch of demons or demon-possessed man. He cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, the most high? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. If you look up that word implore, if you have a modern New American Standard, for example, which uses the actual word, it's the word for I order you or command you. The demon said, I command you that you do not torment me. Why would a demon think it had the power to command God not to torment him? Because Satan had authority on this planet. Because Satan was the ruler. Adam had given all authority to the devil. Thank God Jesus took it back. Jesus said, all authority has now been given unto me. But at this point, Satan has authority. And those demons are going, you're the son of God. You don't have authority to cast me out. That's why Jesus was the son of man. Every, everything Jesus did, he did to the Son of Man, not at the Son of God. But, so let's wrap up with this, this whole idea that, you know, with Job. And as I pointed out, if you read the end of the book, Job was healed. But I'm going to prove to you it was fear. We don't have time, but you can go read it yourself. Job and his friends for 30-some chapters debate why God did this to him. Finally, God gets it, has had it up to here. And God speaks. And he said, who is this that darkens counsel? Then God spends an entire chapter talking about fear. He tells Job, look at a crocodile. He said, you lay your hands on him one time, you won't do it again. He said, that'd be the only time you lay hands. He's fearless. And you know, if you study crocodiles in nature, they are, they're fearless. And he goes through hippopotamuses. You know the hippopotamuses kill more people than anything in Africa. They're violently aggressive. You don't mess with a hippopotamus. He uses a hippopotamus. He goes, they're fearless. They're not afraid of anything. And he said, and in fact, the first thing God tells Job is he says, gird up your loins like a man. Now the only place I have heard that in modern America is Barney Fife says it on the Andy Griffith show before he's going to fight for Thelma Lou. The, the skipper from uh, Gilligan's Island is putting the moves on Thelma Lou. And Barney Fife tells him, gird up your loins, buddy. We're going to fight. None of us use the word gird up your loins. What does gird up your loins mean? Put on your big boy underwear. Isn't that what it means? When a Roman soldier went to battle, he girded up his loins. He'd take that dress-looking thing. I always thought they looked kind of silly. But, you know, they had the big chest thing. But you would tighten up around your loins. You didn't want any of those things. <laughs> Enough said. Enough said. said. <laughs> you didn't want anything getting in the way. <laughs> it's the first thing God tells Job. He said, quit whining. Put your man underwear, put some boxer shorts on, and then let me ask you some questions. And we don't have time to read it because we'll be here another hour, but you can go look it up. He starts talking about fear. He said, look at horses. He said, they'll charge into battle fearless. He said, they don't draw back. They don't whine. They don't complain. The horse goes into battle fearless. This is who we are, brothers and sisters. We are the children of God. We are saved by grace. We're healed by grace. We're delivered by grace. We are free. And don't let somebody throw a bunch of unbelief and junk on you. Well, you never know. Yes, you do know. His name is Healer. Well, how come so-and-so didn't get healed? That's the wrong question. Let's go to the light of the world and ask him what to do. Well, why? No, we don't care about why. Why is an invalid question. Makes you an invalid. Why is not the right question. In fact, the other thing Graham Cook says that I love, he said the, right, the perfect two questions are asked on the day of Pentecost. 
They said, what does this mean? And what must I do? God, what does this mean? Doesn't look like I'm getting healed. What does that mean? What do I need to do? What do I need to adjust? Where do I need to change here? What, what, what's going on? God, tell me what I need to... Mary said, hey, look, I'm a virgin. Don't make sense to me, but be it unto me as you have said. That's who we are. Be it unto me as you have said. I can't see it. I don't know how that would work. I know that 37 people I've laid hands on have dropped dead the second I laid hands on them. It doesn't change the word of God. It doesn't change the truth of God's word. And what he is looking for is us, especially in these last days when they're throwing pandemic diseases at us, we have got to understand our Father's name is healer. And we don't have to be sick. And we need to stand on that. We need to believe him for that. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your promises. We thank you that you're going to give us exceeding revelation in this word here. And that we know if the devil comes to try and steal it, that we can resist him and he will flee from us. And we thank you that you're Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals us. We praise you for it. Lord, we ask you to, to bless the food, to bless the fellowship, that the rest of this evening will be glorifying to you in Jesus' name.